plantation with 70 slaves on it is esteemed as good property. When a man marries off his daughter, he never talks of the fortune and money, but 20 or 30 or 40 slaves. Royal Governor William Tryon. On her wedding day, a woman in the colonies could expect to relinquish control of any property that she owned to her husband. At the time of her second marriage, Martha Dandridge Custis was rumored to be the wealthiest widow in Virginia. Her intended was a military hero with a promising career in politics. The two had spent fewer than three weeks together in all of their lives. On a bitterly cold day in January of 1759, Martha Dandridge Custis and George Washington were wed. Washington was an up-and-coming member of the Virginia aristocracy. He was uh, not a terribly wealthy planter aristocrat, but an individual who certainly had the potential for being uh, a wealthy uh, planter. So he'd made a name for himself, but he never had that kind of money that this marriage brought. Um, to him. The average the planter owned the two or three slaves and farmed not 200 only acres wolves. of tobacco. With his marriage to Martha Custis, Washington increased his slave holdings nine times over, adding 286 slaves to the 30 he already owned. In addition, he gained control of 17,000 acres of farmland, placing him among the ten wealthiest planters in Virginia. It was a fortune he guarded closely. In the years following the Stamp Act, colonists resisted nearly every tax that the Crown imposed. In 1768, a British fleet dropped anchor in Boston Harbor. 4,000 troops came ashore to enforce English law. In March of 1770, occupying British troops shot and killed five men during a confrontation in the streets of Boston. The first to fall was a runaway slave named Crispus Attucks. A former dock worker who was known for not being afraid of a fight, Attucks was shot twice through the chest and died on the spot. Samuel Adams, a savvy pamphleteer, seized upon the killings to turn his fellow colonists against the Crown. Throughout the colonies, March 5, 1770, came to be known as the Boston Massacre. These men became instant martyrs in the revolutionary movement. These people were eulogized year after year on the anniversary, and the terms in which they were utilized became more and more um, sympathetic to them. These were um, noble men that came out. They were fathers and sons. Not one of them was married. They were all bachelors. They had no children. But all of the orphans that were left from them, uh, this became a cause celeb. I speak it with grief. I speak it with anguish. Britons are our oppressors. I speak it with shame. I speak it with indignation. We are slaves. Josiah Quincy, Boston, Massachusetts. Quite naturally, the real slaves are going to pick up on this. And as a reaction to that, African Americans began to protest themselves and began to assess as they have always done, a situation that might be an opportunity for liberty. There will be petition after petition to the Massachusetts Colonial Assembly and then later to the Continental Congress, petitions sent by African slaves themselves saying that we are demanding that you give us the same kind of freedom that you are demanding from England. The humble petition of many slaves living in the town of Boston is this. We expect great things from men who have made such a noble stand against the designs of their fellow men to enslave them. 
We have no property. We have no city, no country. The divine spirit of freedom seems to fire every humane breast on the continent. In 1772, a British judge ruled that slavery was illegal on England's home soil. It was a decision that granted immediate freedom to more than 14,000 people. Though the ruling did not apply to the British colonies, it was a spark of hope for black Americans. Word of that court decision filters very quickly to North America. And we have runaway ads in the Virginia Gazette saying, my slave disappeared last week, heading for the coast, hoping to get on a ship to England where he can establish his freedom. That's how far word had spread. The following year, a London publisher released a book by a 20-year-old American poet named Phyllis Wheatley. He had been born in Africa and abducted into slavery during her childhood. She was purchased as a house servant by a Boston family who taught her to read and write were not only natural her to rights, the Bible. but they were like natural Phyllis learned English quickly and soon advanced to Latin and Greek. Her owners took great pride in her. They spoke of their Phyllis as if she were one of the family, and they invited the leading intellectuals of Boston to come and meet this most unusual slave. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve into political bonds. On July 4th of 1776, the colonies published a formal declaration of their independence from Britain. In it, they railed against George III and the English monarchy. They stated a belief that government should represent the people and not a king. Their reasoning was forceful and eloquent, and at the heart of their argument lay the assertion that all men are created equal. And in just a few words, it captures the essence of inalienable rights. Rights not given to you by the state, but given to you by God. We hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, don't try to, you don't have to prove them. It's self-evident. Why is it self-evident? It came from God. They're inalienable. Government secures them. Remarkable document, but didn't apply to black folks. The principal author was a 33-year-old Virginian named Thomas Jefferson. He was a wealthy aristocrat who possessed a tireless intellect. As a student of politics, Jefferson sought to define a distinctly American view of freedom. He borrowed from ancient Greek democracy, Roman republicanism, and English doctrines of individual rights to shape what would become this new American ideal. Yet, at the time he wrote the Declaration, Thomas Jefferson held title to 202 human beings as his own personal property. While he wrote the very words, all men are created equal, a slave named Bob Hemings waited nearby to attend to Jefferson's every need. Thomas Jefferson kept slaves. But Thomas Jefferson nevertheless wrote those marvelous words and he understood the, the, the inconsistency of this all because he also wrote sometime later to a friend, if there is a just God, we're going to pay for this. With his pen, Jefferson helped create the intellectual foundation of American liberty. Through his slave dealings, he would violate those principles almost every day of his life. Many people would write Jefferson during his lifetime asking him what he meant by all men are created equal. And I don't think he ever gave a very satisfactory uh, explanation to it. But what really mattered, I think, was what other people thought. From what authority do our masters assume the power to dispose of our lives? Freedom is the inherent right of the human species. We feel the dignity of human nature. We feel the passions and desires of other men. 
give us an opportunity of evincing to the world our love of freedom by exerting ourselves in the cause of the country in which we ourselves have been so injuriously oppressed. For the sake of injured liberty, for the sake of justice and the rights of mankind, may the name of slave be heard no more in a land gloriously contending for the sweets of freedom. Signed, Natives of Africa, now detained in slavery.